Hi everyone! Let's take just a few minutes to go over the Module 2 Discussion Board case study because there was a really wide range of discussion board answers and discussion amongst um, all of the students in the class and peers and that's wonderful. I wanted to give an idea of where you should be with regard to what was going on with Terrence and what would have been um, the best approach for this patient. So the first thing I wanted to bring up is this is where your diagnosis really should be focusing on if you were on the right track, the right track. So encounter for well care, many of you missed this. And I can understand why, because when we're doing case studies, it's so easy for us to focus on what's the sick problem, what's the episodic issue, what is the sick diagnosis. But this child came in to see you for a well check, so an encounter for well care does belong in your differential as well as your overall primary and final diagnoses. Next, childhood obesity or obesity or BMI greater than 95th percentile, any one of those diagnoses codes would have been appropriate. This child was morbidly obese and we're going to bring up the growth chart for um, an example of a patient who has those measurements in just a second. The next thing that should have been on your differential list and also in your final primary um, diagnosis list is sleep disorder or dysomnia. And you want to make sure that you're using appropriate ICD-10 codes when you're looking up diagnoses because there were a couple of instances of um, students putting in diagnoses that actually are not considered billable diagnosis codes. And that's important because when you're filling out your electronic uh, medical record, you won't be able to just put in diagnoses that don't have an appropriate billing code. So make sure that you're looking up um, those appropriate billing codes, which can be found on numerous websites. If you just Google ICD-10 codes, you should be able to get yourself a list. There is also a application called ICD-10 Consult, and it is a little red um, icon with a plus sign in the middle of it. Again, ICD-10 Consult, wonderful, um, fabulous resource for you to have, and it's a free application if you have a smartphone or tablet. The last thing, and I didn't mark anybody off for not having this, but the last thing I wanted to make sure you understood about this child is that he has a nutritional deficiency. Kind of hard to believe, right, when you have a patient who's significantly obese that they would have a nutritional deficiency. Well, the truth is, if you take a look at that child's diet recall, he didn't say anything about healthy proteins. He didn't say uh, anything about fruits and vegetables. So um, his diet was consisting of really large amounts of carbohydrates and sugary things or really um, high in sodium things. So um, nutritional deficiency is certainly appropriate for this child as a diagnosis, but you would have certainly been on the right track if you had all three of these. Now one of the other things I saw was that many of you put most of these on your differential list, but by the time you got down to your primary diagnoses, you only picked one. So let's talk a little bit about what a differential list is. When you create a differential diagnosis list, what you are going to be creating is just a list of all possible diagnoses. Okay, what are the 10 to 15 things that are going on in your mind that could be a possible diagnosis for this patient given the subjective and objective information that you have been provided? Okay, that doesn't mean that they have to actually be the diagnosis. A differential is in fact just what could be the diagnosis, okay? But by the time you get down to your primary diagnosis list, that is the actual diagnosis. And any actual diagnosis that this patient has should be on your primary care um, or primary diagnosis list, okay? Just because we ask for a primary diagnosis doesn't mean that you might not have more than one diagnosis, okay? So it's really important for you to put in your final diagnosis list everything that child has based on the subjective and objective data was that was presented to you. All right, so the next thing that I wanted to go over with you really quick is this is a list of the diet recall that Terrence's father gave you uh, when he came in to see you. Ramen noodles, 383 calories, 17 grams of fat. Pop-Tarts, 380 calories, 5 grams of fat. Whole milk, 149 calories, 8 grams of fat. Fruit punch, 240 calories just for the 16 ounces of fruit punch he's drinking. Zero grams of fat. 
a bag of potato chips. An average bag of potato chips is two to five ounces. And I this is on the lower end of calories for potato chips. If they are full fat and not baked, 300 calories, 20 grams of fat. Grilled cheese, when you take into consideration the two pieces of bread, the American cheese that was on it, and possibly the butter or oil to cook it, 200 plus 120, and that would be a conservative estimate, 320 calories total for the grilled cheese, 18 grams of fat. So just for his lunch and his breakfast, Terrence at age four is up to 1,772 calories and 68 grams of fat, okay? A recommended dietary allowance for a day uh, for a normal way, you know, obviously there's lots of dependences on that, but would be about 2,000 for an adult. He's at 1,700 and he is obese. And that's only for two meals that he's had thus far. The next thing I wanted you to take a look at is the weight and height chart for him. Okay, so Terrence is above the 97th percentile for his weight. He's short. He's in about the 10th percentile for his height. I know some of you had mentioned that there might be an endocrinological disorder going on with him because he's short. It's possible. You would really need more information to see if he's falling off the growth chart with height. But it's not really super likely that him being in the 10th percentile would automatically give him an endocrine disorder unless he had other concomitant things going on. Okay? So, again... He's pretty high here, right? Above the 95th, above the 97th, and 99th percentile for his weight. Here's the even more concerning thing. This is Terrence's BMI, okay? He has between a 26 and 27 BMI, well above the 97th percentile, okay? He's morbidly obese at his height and weight, guys. All right. So when some of you were mentioning to me that he was overweight and you would counsel on nutrition and counsel on activity and, you know, you might cut out some sugar in his diet, we need serious, extensive counseling for his weight because at this point he's at major risk for other comorbidities, including pulmonary disorders, cardiac disorders, musculoskeletal disorders. OK, kids this um, heavy can just break their bones and their feet from stress fractures, guys. All right. So let's take a look at one more thing. This is likely what Terrence would look like coming in to see you at the 10th percentile for height and his BMI. So it's probably a little bit more clear to you when you take a look at this child's picture of what you would be seeing in the office. But the important thing is that you want to make sure you can understand, comprehend, and calculate measurements and data that's provided to you without necessarily seeing that child because sometimes you're going to see the chart, the information, and everything that's going on. You'll get phone calls without seeing that patient. So I'm sure it's a little bit clearer to you now, whoa, I would probably do more for this patient had I seen um, what was going on with him physically. But it's important to know that a body mass index well over the 97th percentile, I mean, he was way above the growth chart, uh, really requires some um, significant treatment and also some significant differential diagnosis planning. Now, for Terrence's plan, okay, um, extensive nutrition counseling would be one thing. Avoid all sugary drinks, okay? No child who's that obese needs to be drinking any calories. I don't know about you, but me, I'm not a thin girl. I don't like to drink my calories. I like to eat them. Kids are the same way, all right? Recommend drinking sugar-free liquids and drinking lots of water. Milk is still a good thing, okay? But he really shouldn't have any more than 16 ounces of milk, and that should be skim or low-fat milk only. In addition, we need to cut out the Pop-Tarts, cut out the ramen noodles, we need to cut out the potato chips, the grilled cheese, and, you know, extra servings. Portion control is essential for children who have obesity, and it's also very commonly seen. Parents will tell me all the time, he's always hungry, and I am giving him seven helpings, and he's still not hungry, or he's still not full. So... It's important to train these kids that portion control is important because once they start eating, you know, portions that are normal and healthy, the transitional epithelium in their stomach is going to decrease. 
Okay, so when you have a kid who's eating way more than they should, their stomach's going to be normally expanded a little bit, okay, because that's what the tissue in our stomach does. The bladder and the stomach have tissue that's epithelium transitional, and it will expand and contract and expand and contract the more you put in it. So if we are giving him better portions, then he will continue to eat less in the future, all right? Lots of activity. 60 minutes per day is required for all kids, okay, from the American Heart American Heart Association, American Academy of Pediatrics, that's what's recommended for all kids, no matter um, if they're obese or not. We want kids to be physically active because that is what's healthy. <clears throat> Next, he needs blood work, okay? Um, if you have a child who is morbidly obese and eating such as the diet that was explained to you, there's a possibility of some comorbidities going on, such as metabolic syndrome, um, you know, early diabetes mellitus, possibly something thyroid going on. You would want to get a thyroid panel, at least a TSH, okay? A hemoglobin A1C, possibly a CMP to make sure that his liver functions are okay. Some kids who are morbidly obese will have fatty infiltration of the liver, okay? And that is evident on a CMP because his liver enzymes might be elevated. If you've got a really obese kid who just you've ordered a CMP on something else for something else and you've noted that they've got really elevated liver enzymes, one of the first things you should be thinking about is the fatty infiltration of the liver. And that's simply because kids who have fatty liver disease, um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, will have elevated liver enzymes. All right. So next, you want to make sure that you are educating for the sleep disorder. Okay. So. Yes, he's got a dysomnia, but he's also got caffeine that he's drinking a lot. He's drinking lots of sodas. He's got an unhealthy diet, and he's got um, lots of juice. Sleep and nutrition, oh boy, they're buddies, okay? They lock hand in hand. One does not go well without the other going well. So improving his nutrition will likely improve his sleep. Also talking to the parents about modifications for behavior to help with sleep. You learned about extinction, modified extinction, and bedtime pass in chapter one in um, the didactic course, or I'm sorry, module one and two in the didactic course. So apply that here. How would you educate the caregivers about behavioral modifications to help with sleep? If he's not snoring and he's not having horrible gasping at night and he's just having problems getting to sleep and staying asleep, he might just have a typical sleep disorder, okay, which would not require him to necessarily be referred to a sleep specialist. But if he's got snoring and gasping and not sleeping well and he's tired a lot and or he's, um, you know, having trouble falling asleep and staying asleep, then he may need a sleep disorder or, or a sleep test and a sleep specialist, okay? You were not given the information that he did have um, any snoring or any kind of problems with sleeping. You were just given the basic information about sleep hygiene, but at the minimum, there needs to be good education about sleep hygiene and uh, if you see him on a recheck, this child should come back for a recheck in at least um, no more than one month. Okay, and if you see him on recheck, we're still having problems with sleep, even though they have intervened with the behavioral modifications you've done, and you've talked about nighttime routine and organization for sleep, then melatonin could be something that you would implement. Melatonin is a medicinal uh, treatment that's very safe for sleeping kids that are as young as two years old. Okay, so... Um, with regard to, you know, the other treatments, you guys really did a great job discussing your differential diagnoses and, you know, talking about all the things that you would educate on, but it's really important. Those two things, obesity and sleep, okay, and diet and nutrition counseling are essential. Any questions, clarifications, or um, things you want me to clear up about this case study, feel free to give me a call. Or, I'm sorry, give me an email. <laughs> Thanks.